And next I have uh, Suds from our Silicon Valley chapter to introduce our next panel. Come on out. You ready? Great. Good morning, everyone. Sorry that you had to leave your coffee outside, but you won't need it for this panel. <laughs> so uh, this panel is about how we get uh, support. As you know, uh, the Climate Solutions Caucus was started by mayors of Florida cities going to approach their members of Congress and saying, look, our cities are getting flooded. So we have local uh, staffers for electeds, and we have uh, uh, one elected, a supervisor here, and talking about how um, they got resolutions passed and, and how they are creating this uh, movement to, to convince members of Congress. So our moderator today is Bruce Hagan, whom all of you know. Um, and the one thing that I always remember about Bruce is he's always got a harmonica. So he worked for a senator for three years, and he's the co-founder with Harold Hedelman and Bruce, Steve Hamm of the Business Climate Leaders uh, Group. And uh, their major accomplishment so far has been that they got Microsoft to host a meeting of, of uh, high-tech companies to talk about carbon pricing. And uh, the CEO of Microsoft uh, is very interested in carbon pricing. Uh, and then uh, just the thing that he's most proud of, I think, is that two weeks ago he had a new granddaughter. So. So the first person to accept our invitation to serve on this panel is Leslie Alden. She's uh, an, an aide. She's an aide to uh, Supervisor Kate, Spe Kate Sears in Marin County. And uh, she has a BA uh, in Education and Public Policy from Berkeley. Um, she's been working in the supervisor's office for 12 years. Uh, she was very instrumental in getting Marine Clean Energy, which is the first community choice energy in California. And now we have about 15 of those. And now she's working on a new project, she, which she will describe, which is Drawdown Marin. And she actually skipped the Women's March yesterday because she was working. And uh, she's working on reducing, turning Marin into a carbon neutral county. So, uh, and uh, our next panel, our next panelist uh, is Chris Moylan, who's a um, director, uh, the local area director for Congressman Ro Khanna, who is my member of Congress. I've talked to Chris many times, and I can say without doubt that Ro is very lucky to have him on staff. Uh, he's got a bachelor's in, uh, in chemistry from Princeton University, a PhD in chemistry from Stanford, then he worked for IBM for 13 years, and then he worked for three startups, and then he decided to go into teaching. So he taught uh, for three years, and uh, then joined um, uh, Rose staff uh, two years ago. So he's also been a Sunnyvale City Council member for eight years. The next panelist is Supervisor Dave Pine from San Mateo. Um, As a freshman at Dartmouth, he ran and won a seat in the New Hampshire House of Representatives. So at age 19, he was the, one of the youngest people ever elected in New Hampshire. <laughs> then he went to law school in Michigan, and then he came to California to work for Fenwick and West in Palo Alto. He left there to join a startup and got the bug and ended up working for three startups. And uh, I've worked for startups, and I can't even imagine how Dave found time to be on the planning commission in Redwood City. So then he was elected to school boards, and now he's supervisor. So welcome, everyone. So we're going to do, we're going to do, Enrico Caruso. <laughs> so 
So we'll, we'll pass the mic around, be a little cl clunky. Uh, I wanted to start off by, uh, as a recently uh, newly minted grandparent, uh, how much I appreciate the work that all of you up here and your colleagues and the people in the audience are doing on behalf of grandchildren and their grandchildren everywhere. It means a lot to me, so thank you. Uh, so I want to start at kind of a high level uh, and get a little philosophical and then we'll get down into the, the, the trees and the weeds. Uh, that Citizens Climate Lobby, our, part of our mission is to create political will for a livable future. I'm going to turn my chair around a little bit here so I can see you. And, um, political will is not a term that we hear a lot of. We hear politics a lot of, and they're in, usually in different contexts. But I'd like for you to think about or tell me what your thoughts are about uh, the difference between the two and how that might inform not only the actions that we do to try to change uh, uh, climate policy, but policy making in general. Oh, oh wait a minute. Yeah, you're all supposed to do your, thank you. Uh, you're supposed to give us five minutes. Give you, I'm gonna give you each five minutes to think about that. <laughs> and you can give it, tell us about your background, so. We obviously don't have to go through the whole thing because we got a nice intro, but uh, a little over a year ago, I was teaching chemistry and drama at San Jose High School, and Congressman Kana asked me to be his district director. Um, which meant telling one of the nicest bosses I ever had, the principal, that I would be bailing out on her in the middle of the school year. And all those poor low-income kids we had uh, would have to have other people cover the classes. But the other teachers who were going to cover those classes all came to me and said, you have to do this. It's a chance to make even more of a difference. Teachers know they're making a difference. But this was possibly an opportunity to make even more of a difference. It also involved giving up tenure and taking a temp job, <laughs> which after you, you know, You've been working as a scientist in Silicon Valley for a while and getting laid off multiple times and having your startup companies go out of business. Tenure was a very sweet thing. <laughs> when it was granted to me, I thought I heard angelic voices. Tenure, ah! <laughs> So I still, uh, I can't believe I gave it up. But this is the most important issue in the world. Um, one thing the principal said to me was, well, maybe the congressman would be willing to come to our high school and speak sometime. <laughs> the high school is actually in Zell Lofgren's district, but uh, Rose said, well, we should do some sort of announcement. I go, can we do it at San Jose High School? And he said, yeah. So we went to San Jose High School, and they let a bunch of my chemistry kids and my drama kids get out of class, and they're all in the bleachers. And I said to the students, what's the most important problem in the world? And they all said, global warming. And I said, I'm very proud of you. If that's the only thing you remember from everything I taught you, that's the right thing uh, to have. Um, many of my students were very afraid after the election of getting deported. You know, I myself, on the climate issue, was just completely demoralized after the election, which was a motivating factor. So I was sitting there apologizing to my international baccalaureate chemistry class and then this one girl, Eileen Huerta, said, Dr. Moylan, we forgive you. <laughs> but just as the previous speaker said in the panel, I feel a responsibility to deliver the results. Right? If, if those kids all had to make that sacrifice and my poor principal had to make that sacrifice, I better accomplish something. So I try to make sure my member understands this issue in detail. Thank you. I think there's a quote by E.B. White that goes something like this. I wake up every morning wanting to change the world and have a good time, and this makes planning my day difficult. <laughs> and, and that's how I roll. Um, and uh, he's funnier than I am. Um, but 
um, but uh, yeah, I've been in my position for 12 years working uh, at the county level in Marin and was really fortunate to be hired by the late Supervisor Charles McGlashan. And um, I, he said, you're going to be my CCA aide. I had absolutely no idea what that was. Um, but what that turned out to be was Marine Clean Energy, which was the first um, CCA in the state of California and the first one in the country to be focused on 100% renewable energy. And it was a battle. It was years, actually. Um, but how it started, and I think the thing that you know this group might be interested in, is it started with one person who had an idea, who spoke to a couple of other people who said, "Yeah, that sounds possible." And this was literally, you know, sitting on the grass at our local community college, um, and the word and the movement sort of getting up to uh, our state senator at that time, Carol uh, Mignon, who wrote the enabling legislation for community choice aggregation in the state of California. Um, that was in 2002. We didn't start delivering power until 2010. So you can imagine there was an awful lot of work that happened between 02 and actually the initial conversations, which were before that, to the point where we actually started serving customers. Um, and we started small. We started with 6,500 um, uh, uh, customers, rate payers, and now it has gone practically statewide. Um, marine Clean Energy is no longer Marine Clean Energy, it's MCE Clean Energy because we have um, Contra Costa County, all of Napa County, uh, Benicia, and lots of other cities in the East Bay, not just Marin. So this little grassroots conversation with a couple of people that went up to our super, a couple of our supervisors, uh, the late Hal Brown and the late Charles McGlashan, and actually, I guess this work can kill you. Um, um, but we, but we, keep, we keep doing it, right? Until, as, as from Shakespeare, um, you know, when the end is all there is, it still matters, right? Um, there's nothing more important, as Chris said, uh, than this. And at the, at the council level, at your towns, or your cities, um, there's an awful lot that really gets done and people show up at the county level um, which is generally unincorporated. It's not a town or a city. Most people don't even know they have a supervisor. Sorry, Dave. Um, <laughs> it's true, though. They don't. Um, it, you know, it, everyone is just really getting to work and paying the bills and picking the kids up at, at soccer and, and just managing their daily lives. And they're involved in their community, maybe, um, but maybe not. And so this is the sort of thing where it's, it's about relationships. And, and it's about developing relationships and trust and, and being credible over time. And I think what, uh, what Bruce wants us to talk about is those relationships and how we build movements. And I think, I actually want to take a, a temperature in the room here or just figure out who the audience is. How many of you are just from the Bay Area? Okay. Well, because there's the whole state. And there's Northern California. So how many people are here from counties outside of the nine Bay Area counties? Yay! Okay, wonderful, wonderful. And so, you know, we tend to think in the Bay Area or in LA, we've got so many people um, and many constituents that that's where the power is. But I think when we start talking about how to reach beyond the usual suspects, the early adopters, like how do we move this movement further out into communities that might not be as interested. So I think what happens, um, I, there's someone in the audience here who brought a resolution to our office um, on a resolution to support um, a fee and dividend. And he didn't really understand why we changed the language and added a bunch of stuff, but my boss, Supervisor Kate Sears, was in the process of suing or setting up the lawsuit to sue um, the fossil fuel industry. So we had to kind of massage the language a little bit to kind of protect some of that. Um, but this is how it happens. It's people developing relationships with their, with their electeds and with their neighbors and with the businesses that they, they frequent. And, and we move forward uh, collectively by building relationships. So 
Um, I started without not, with knowing not much at all about CCA, and we have a movement in California. So CCL, I think, and the, the fee and dividend uh, has a real opportunity to work district by district um, and county by county. Thank you. So while it's the second day of the conference, let me uh, welcome you to San Mateo County. Um, it's uh, really uh, been a privilege to work with our local um, citizen climate lobby, uh, who've done great work here. And you know, one thing um, you know, I'll say as an elected is, it, the work we do is hard, and many of these problems seem so intractable, and we have a lot of demands on our time, and um, uh, you know, it can be a struggle. And when you, a group like Citizens Climate Lobby, for me, you know, really provides inspiration, and we all need, need inspiration. So in addition to getting Congress to do the right thing, you know, you're, you're, you're inspiring people, and that's, um, you know, we all need a dose of that. Uh, and the other thing I just want to emphasize in this, uh, these opening remarks is you know, how important, you know, local action is. Uh, I'm really, you know, proud of what we're doing here in San Mateo County. We're uh, really aggressively approaching the mitigation side of climate, uh, the climate crisis, as well as the adaptation side. So with respect to, to mitigation, like Marin, um, with the help of our, uh, the local uh, CCL chapter, we passed a resolution in support of the carbon fee and dividend. Um, you know, we were inspired by Marin to form the, um, the fifth community choice energy entity here in San Mateo, Peninsula Clean Energy, so now, Virtually every resident and business in our county has 80% greenhouse gas free energy. <laughs> We've created an office of sustainability to really champion um, you know, changes in behavior by, by individuals and efficiency to try to lower our carbon footprint. And then as uh, uh, Leslie mentioned, uh, we uh, brought a lawsuit against the major uh, oil and, and uh, carbon uh, uh, emitters and producers. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're kind of go we're going at it at all fronts, and this is an issue that demands that. We have to use every tool available to us at every level and every venue to, to make, the, you know, to, to, to get on top of this and to save our planet. Sadly, um, as everyone knows, though, we have emitted an awful lot of carbon, and uh, that is in the atmosphere, and the climate has, the, the, the earth has warmed, the ocean has absorbed an incredible amount of uh, heat, and we're going to see, and we are seeing, uh, impacts from climate change. For me, it was really sobering, I didn't really even realize this till not long ago, that in, you know, the genie's out of the bottle. We, we, we can't put, you know, climate change, you know, we, we can't make it go away. It's, it, it's, it, and I'm not sure that a lot of people appreciate that, that, you know, it, it's critical that we stop future emissions, but we have to live with the consequences of, of what we've already done. And in our county, San Mateo in particular, uh, has this incredible risk uh, or future, future challenge of sea level rise. We're the most exposed county in the entire state because historically we developed well into the bay. And uh, we're going to see the bay rise by at least three feet by the turn of the century. And it's going to have major, the major challenge for us to think through how to deal with that. So uh, uh, we are going to continue to fight to, to reduce emissions, but we also have to prepare for the harm we've already done. Thanks. So, forget that earlier question. Oh, <laughs> I've been working on my answer the whole time. Well, if you want to address that as well, but I, I think given the limited amount of time we have and from the comments that you made, uh, we as an organization are really laser focused uh, on uh, carbon pricing, carbon fee and dividend as national policy. And people are involved in a lot of other things in, in their political lives 
as well as working on state and local initiatives for, for climate protection. But with this uh, trying to get, I forget how many votes, 235 votes in the House and 51 votes in the Senate, and uh, not a veto by the President for carbon fee and dividend, how can we take what we're doing pretty well on right on the coast here, how can we move that with the help of cities and counties, move it inland, move it to the Central Valley, move it to Nevada and on across? What are some of the things that our volunteers here and elsewhere need to keep in mind as we do that? And that can be the, across the, you know, uh, uh, reaching across party lines and whatever else it might be, so. Okay. Um, we had, Congressman Connor holds a town hall meeting every month. The January run was last week. Standing room only, 470 people in a place that seats 380. There was one question about this issue. One. Every other question was about immigration visas. Every other one. That's what my boss gets to hear from his community. We want our visas, we want our visas, we want our visas. Oh, by the way, what about global warming? Okay. The reason health care didn't get wiped out was because citizens all told their members of Congress, don't you dare take away my health care. Congressman in Utah had a town hall meeting where 3,000 people showed up, all shouting, do your job, do your job. And he then quit. <laughs> <laughs> Tom McClintock uh, has similar town halls, but they roll off his back. Apparently, he's such an ideologue, he doesn't care. Um, everyone is being hurt by this problem. That's why it's really inherently a nonpartisan issue. But different sides of the spectrum care about different pieces of that issue. So, to help our friends in uh, other areas, we need to make sure they understand the cost. We are already paying for this. I talked to a fisherman that Jackie Spears office referred to me up on Pier 45. And he told me about how there's hardly any fishing boats left there. Why is that? Global warming. So I said, you see the effects of this in your job every day? Yes. I then got this fantasy of a congressional hearing that's supposedly about fisheries and then have that guy start denouncing global warming. That would be so great. Um, you know that global warming makes extreme weather events more likely. We've had a couple of category five uh, hurricanes this year hundreds of billions of dollars in damage. It really seems to me that people in Texas and people in Florida should be asking their member of Congress, what are you doing about this because we can't afford the next one, which is true. If you focus on the cost side, that tends to help persuade people at the other end of the spectrum. But we also have to have people show up at town hall meetings and say, what are you doing about this? So it doesn't get drowned out by other issues. Thanks. So back to relationships. Um, what you do in your community, whether it's at the council level, Everyone talks to everybody. Super, county supervisors talk both with city councils in their district, but also with the state uh, assembly members and senators, and with their congressional leaders as well. So there's this, you know, it's kind of up and down, and, and when we start talking about across the aisle, uh, we start talking about bipartisanship, as, as Chris said, this affects everybody. It affects different localities differently. If you're on the coast, it's sea level rise. Marin County and, and uh, San Mateo and all the other Bay Area counties are going to see sea level rise. Of course, we're already experiencing it. But we also have catastrophic fires here in California. In Marin, in Sonoma and Napa are just to the north of us. And we opened up our evacuation shelter to, to we had over 600 people in Marin um, for that first week after the fires. Um, I was talking with our uh, county chief, fire chief, 
uh, on Friday. And he said, you know, I got a lot of guys who were kind of climate deniers. They're looking around now as fire professionals and recognizing that something's very different. Farmers recognize that something is different. Fishermen recognize that something has changed as well. So it's having the language and understanding what the leverage, I mean, we're all looking for that leverage point, um, how we can get a message across, how we can connect with people, and it's a personal thing. Um, and having those relationships that you build over time um, make a, a huge difference in wherever you are and whatever it is you're trying to get done. So I would, I think, it, this seems like such an extraordinarily well-schooled group of activists and advocates and lobbyists in this room. I kind of feel like I don't have a lot to add to what you already know, but I think it's really important to recognize that um, you don't have to agree with everything a politician is working on, but you find the thing that they care about that relates to the topic that you want them to pay attention to. And then you come in, um, I mean, I remember the first time I spoke in front of, you know, government body and I was, my hands were sweaty and I, um, I was probably, my mouth was dry and I was speaking probably too fast because I knew there was a time limit. But they're just human beings like all of us and they have office hours and they do community meetings and you know they want to hear from their constituents and as Chris said, and I, it's true for, for every elected, um, at, at sort of the, the most basic level, it's about the potholes, it's about the things that affect people's everyday lives that, that you know, they're going to come and yell at us or, you know, maybe not yell at us, but they're going to nudge us. And those are the things that we pay attention to in our offices. Um, but if I have a relationship with a constituent and I know them, it's not that I'm not going to take someone else's call, but I might spend a little bit more time and, and move something forward if I know that the person or, that, or the group that they're representing has credibility and they've been working on something for a long time. So we'll meet. And, and as, as Crystal, I'm sure, attest, and, and you as well, you have a wonderful staff. I really like your staff. I'd come work for you too if I didn't have such a great boss myself. But, uh, and, and lived in San Mateo. But, um, you know, it's meeting with staff members is not a bad thing. It's not an insult that you're not meeting with the elected um, representative. Uh, they're really incredibly busy and they have 50 things on their plate at least, completely unrelated things that they have to be expert enough on to, you know, make intelligent policy decisions for the greater good. So meeting with staff is where you can kind of spend it maybe instead of 10 minutes or 15 minutes, you could get half an hour, maybe even an hour, where you can really develop the relationship, explain, and ask the questions that you want them to know the answers to. Because they might not have had time to read all the things that you sent them by email. So if you're presenting them with everything you want them to know, Think of the questions that you would like them to be asking you and put those questions out there with the answer so that they don't feel stupid um, and they don't maybe expose the fact that they didn't get to read everything and highlight it in yellow pen. Um, but we, we're here for our constituents um, as staff and certainly you know, representing our bosses um, with our constituents. So um, just soldier on. Um, and you take it from, from office to office, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's top down and it's bottom up. And it, you know, hitting all of those and doing it sort of laterally as well. I think someone mentioned chambers of commerce, schools, um, the rotary. It's having these conversations everywhere because it really is about something that affects everyone. It does not matter where you live. It doesn't matter the color of your skin or your income level or whether you're blue or red or undecided or declined to state. Thanks. So I think part of the, the question is how can we here you know, in, in the Bay Area where we share a lot of common values and are very progressive and understand climate change and uh, have congressional representatives who uh, are, are with us, you know, how do we influence um, you know, other parts of the state in, in the country? 
Um, and I, I think about that. Um, and first, I often tell people that, you know, if it's not within 100 yards of El Camino Real, you know, I'm, I, it, that's where I'm really focused. I'm very focused local. That's kind of my job. But uh, on an issue of this kind, I, I, I need to kind of stretch out beyond that. And you know, certainly, uh, CCL was helpful in that in urging us to bring a resolution forward. And so I think it is a challenge to us local electeds to you know, think hard about how we can influence um, um, people outside of the Bay Area. Uh, so, you know, a couple of things come to mind. One concrete thing that we are doing in the community choice energy movement, uh, we, we have big fights uh, in Sacramento, and our, 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 our fate is really very much tied up in regulation and the CPUC and uh, the legislature. And we are criticized or perceived sometimes as mostly kind of a coastal uh, movement. Um, so one thing that uh, we've talked about doing and will do uh, is, is try to support uh, inland uh, counties that are looking at creating community choice energy. So in our particular case, I'm really proud of this, uh, Peninsula Clean Energy um, entered into a contract to have a 200 megawatt solar facility built in Merced County. Uh, we are the sole off-taker of, of, we will be the sole off-taker of this 200 megawatt facility. And this is actually why this movement was started. We we're creating this demand for more uh, clean energy. But, so we kind of have a, a, a foothold now in Merced. Merced is incredibly excited about this facility because they have much higher, uh, you know, unemployment. And this is a big deal for them. And their county supervisors are really excited about it. So, uh, you know, we'd like to see and support them in perhaps creating a community choice energy um, uh, organization. And you know, maybe we can go further in, 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 in trying to get them to, you know, support uh, carbon fee and dividend. So we, you know, we as electeds have, you know, touch points that, that you know, perhaps with your help we could try to, uh, to utilize. Um, my, my, my colleague on the board has served for many years, Supervisor Groom, on the County Association, the California Association of, of County Government, CSAC. And, you know, perhaps that's a, a venue where this, this board, where this movement, this CCL and car carbon fee and dividend could, could do some work. And then finally, to state the obvious, you know, we have to win Congress back, I mean, period. So, you know, all of us uh, have to go into those competitive districts around the state and do what we can, or send them a check, or do phone banking from home. I mean, we, I mean, we have to do that. We have to do that. So those are a couple ideas. Thanks. I was interested in the comments about the cost to localities, and a lot of times the costs tend to flow downward as the money flows upward to the state and federal government. Uh, that's a critique that comes from the left and the right. Um, my hometown of Petaluma spent $42 million on a flood wall that probably will be a nice little waterfall in uh, 30 or 40 years, and they're having to pay for that. They'll have to pay for the extension of it or whatever happens if they don't. And I'm wondering to what extent the discussion of these costs of climate change can be brought into conversations with cities and counties to help move them, as, as you said, uh, uh, to uh, look at this issue more closely beyond just uh, resiliency mitigation, but actually try to do some preventative work. To, that is, as they plan their budgets out, if they can look beyond a year or two and looking out to the point where the fires and the floods and everything else are going to really hit the city budget. Yeah. Yeah, we're sure. We're happy to talk about that here in, in San Mateo County. Um, and we've, we've done a lot of work um, in, in assessing our vulnerability to sea level rise and to major storm events. So, you know, this, this winter we could have a 100-year storm, perhaps, or a so-called 1% storm. And, you know, in that scenario, there's a billion dollars uh, at, at risk. That's without any, any sea level rise. And under the assessment we've done, if you look out to uh, 2100 and three feet of sea level rise plus a 100-year storm or 1% storm, you know, the numbers go into the $35 billion range. I mean, this is a big, uh, a big, big risk for our county. 
And I think um, local leaders understand that now after kind of beating on this drum for a couple of years. Um, but but the, the, the challenges are, I think, are twofold. Uh, first off, we have 20 cities in the county. Um, and we don't, there's not like a regional mechanism to, to really go after this. Um, and then secondly, you know, where's the, where's the money going to come from? But, you know, those, those, those big challenges aside, uh, I think it's, no matter how much we educate uh, local policy makers, um, you know, human nature is such that people like to respond to a crisis more than they like to try to plan, plan ahead. So, uh, those are the challenges. But that said, there's a lot going on uh, here on the ground in, in San Mateo County. Um, in Foster City, because they uh, have the risk of being characterized by FEMA as being in a, in a, in a flood zone or a coastal hazard zone, and, and then their residents would have to pay f flood insurance, which is, is very, very costly. Uh, to prevent that, they're building a, uh, or enhancing the, their levee system, their 7.5 mile levee that protects the, the city. That's like a $90 million project that's happening. Uh, I serve on a, a joint powers authority uh, that works on flood control uh, around the San Francisco Creek, which separates Santa Clara from San Mateo. And we have a big project called Safer Bay, which is a nine mile um, uh, uh, project to, consisting of levees and tidal wetland restoration that would stretch from Palo Alto all the way to, to Redwood City. And you know, San Francisco Airport, which actually is quite fortunate to have a very nice revenue stream, uh, has done a lot of planning for sea level rise and, and will have the means to address it. So, um, you know, we, we, are, we, are making, we are making progress, but I mentioned the challenges of governance and financing. And the other one, too, is this is not a problem that, unfortunately, you, like, just solve because the, 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 the seas are going to rise for hundreds of years. Uh, but it's, it's, you know, each generation is going to have to grapple with it as best it can. One thing that uh, we've been hearing a fair amount about and need to recognize in our attack on this problem is that each of the different levels of government owns a different piece of this. Um, the lobby is, of course, mostly focusing on the highest level of government, the feds, where we have a challenge under the current political climate. Although, as was pointed out earlier, I think this year there's some serious leverage for some people who are endangered species and might be inclined to uh, uh, help out on this nonpartisan issue. We've heard some great work being done at the county level, right? That sort of lowest regional level. These uh, you know, community choice power things are really great regional things. Down at the city level, that is where land use lies. City council members have local control as one of their mantras. To, you, know, you, can, you can have my zoning code when you pry it out of my cold, dead hands, is a typical city council member's mantra. And a lot of the carbon footprint we have is based on how we use our land, where people live, where people work, and how they get between the two. And that's all done at the city level. Uh, yeah, I guess, in, and also in unincorporated parts of county, too. So, your city needs to have its carbon footprint and a plan for how it's going to reduce that. Now we get up to the state. We've already shown multiple times. I mean, one example is stem cell research. Up at the federal level, to pander to certain people, uh, they said, thou shalt not do stem cell research because it offends some of our constituents. California said, okay, fine, we'll do it. <laughs> right? And California has done it. Um, California is big enough that you can get away with stuff like that. So at the state level, if the feds aren't going to cooperate, we should consider having the state take actions. Okay, well, the rest of you won't do it. We'll do it here. And so we should be lobbying our state representatives on that. Uh, <laughs> I'm going 
to say a dirty word. For example, with good intentions, the state has banned all future nuclear power plants. Many people are happy about that. But they are carbon neutral, right? That's something we have to think about. Uh, we still, of course, need to be deploying solar as rapidly as we possibly can. It's free. Uh, there's a, a place in Golden, Colorado, suburb of Denver, Energy Lab, and it has a color-coded map of the United States. And it shows where solar energy is actually viable. And the, the redder the color, the more viable solar is. And the, if it's purple, it's not really viable. And amazingly enough, there's only three spots in the entire United States that are purple. One, Seattle. <laughs> Two, Western New York, Buffalo, Rochester, all that stuff. If you've ever been there, the sun never shines there. It's, I get seasonal affective disorder every time I go there. And three, virtually the entire state of Maine. Apparently, it never, the sun never shines there either. But everywhere else, solar is viable. And that's something that at your county level, your city level, your regional level, you can push for that. So we have to figure out what we can do at every single level of government. Tell our city council members that we want to reduce the carbon footprint by how we control the land use. Tell our, our county people we want regional power things. Tell our state people we want the state to enact what we are also hoping the feds to do. And then show up at the town hall meetings and tell the congressman. I don't have too much to add to that, but I, I think it's really clear that we can't adapt our way out of this. Um, although adaptation planning is essential, um, I think the other thing in terms of land use planning that we have to be talking about is elegant retreat. And what does that look like? And how do we create communities away from the shoreline as the sea level rises? The, the stranded assets and the, the, the cost, and you're right, we, we, do, we respond to crises and we're not very good at planning forward. But that said, that economic argument is, is a, a big piece of this as we, as we move forward. If we you know, continue with business as usual, as all of you know, we're, we're really in, in deep trouble. Um, but talking about that economic piece, what happens if we do nothing or we don't do enough or we don't go full throttle to do absolutely everything we can? What, what are those stranded assets? What's it gonna cost? I mean, we're talking a little bit about that, but you know, if, if sea level rise, for instance, floods our main highways in Marine County, that's 101, that's, that's you know, Golden Gate Bridge 101 up to Sonoma. That's our only real road. We have one bridge that goes between Marin and the East Bay, which actually also is very much uh, subject to sea level rise on, on, on one end. So as we start talking about what happens to us now, if, if we don't start thinking about this, the, our property values will go down which will give us even less income at the county level and the, the town level to do the things that need to be done to adapt. So it's this really scary circular conversation about where we spend money now and, and, and what that might help us or not um, in the future. So um, I think that economic argument is something that is bipartisan. Um, I, I, you know, I, I would assume that many here are are of the more progressive persuasion with, I'm wearing red, but, but most of you might be wearing blue. Um, and I wear blue too. Um, yes, and green. But, but back to the kind of that original question, Bruce, about how do we talk to people who we might not be aligned with politically and talk about what is in everyone's best interest and how do we find consensus. I think that we have to recognize that, that laws get made when there is consensus, policy, is driven when you can find common ground. So it is essential to, I mean, this is obviously a, an organization that is nonpartisan, and I think that that's a huge piece of this. It's not to make it about politics, it's to make it about you know, the future that I think everyone wants for their families, for their children, and for their communities. Thank you. So I think we will, I'm gonna uh, ask one more question and then we'll open it up to audience questions. And Stuart, are you handy? Okay. 
So uh, the last question is, I'm involved uh, with a, a, a project team in Citizens Climate Lobby called Business Climate Leaders, and we've been working with in Fortune 1000 companies. Uh, we've got a, an active relationship with the Silicon Valley Leadership Group that's going to produce some fruit pretty soon, as well as any other large company like Unilever, uh, New Belgium Brewing. But basically, we're trying to get the business community at that high level to engage in advocacy in Washington, DC, and at the same time, uh, bring in their local factories or their bakeries or their offices to talk to their members of Congress, like the town hall meetings, but more like what happened in Florida, where they show up in their suits in the office of the, of the uh, member of Congress. And local governments, uh, many people in local governments, most in my experience, are not uh, lawyers so much as they are local business people. Can they help us get introductions, uh, meetings with some of these people that uh, we might have been, on whose doors we might have been knocking for a year? And a large part of this is the networking. Who do you know? Who can you introduce us to? Uh, so that meeting can take place. And then we can start talking about all these things, the nonpartisanship, the uh, mitigation, the, all of that. Uh, is that, is that, are there vehicles there? Not, I mean, having a resolution passed is wonderful because you can just put it out in front of somebody. But the person-to-person -person thing would also be helpful as well. Comments? Every business person you can get to go in and make this case is probably worth several of us individual citizens under the current climate. You know, uh, Ronald Reagan hung Calvin Coolidge's picture up in his office because there was something Calvin Coolidge had said that Ronald Reagan totally believed in. The business of America is business. The United States apparently exists for the purpose of making life easy for corporations not for freedom or liberty or any of those other things they told us about in the Boy Scouts. Uh, it's all about business. And, you know, we've just seen the tax bill. That's all about business, okay? The current federal government is interested in making life better for business. And so if business people go in and make that case, they will have more of an effect. And it's not just people in other parts of the country. When I was on the city council, for eight years, I went out to Washington, D.C. for the National League of Cities Conference. And we would always try to meet with all of our representatives who were there. Uh, our members in the House, our own member at the time was Anna Eshoo. She'd always meet with us. But Mike Honda would always meet with us. Zoe so Loeffler would always meet with us. As far as the Senate goes, Barbara Boxer would always hold a town hall meeting where we could all go, we could ask her questions. And of course, she was like chairing a committee on this stuff for a while. She totally got it. Um, in eight years, I never succeeded in getting to meet Dianne Feinstein. 0 oh for 8. Uh, but one time we came back from one of those meetings and the leadership group was having a, an event for all the corporate people and there was Diane sitting on the panel. All right? So for some people, you go through the business community to get to them. For other people, you can go through citizen activists to get them. And we had one of each of those as our senators in, from California. I think that's a very promising approach. And it's going to cost those guys a lot of money. You would hope that the, the oil companies will eventually stop trying to trade the future of the planet for some temporary profits and do what the tobacco companies did when it became clearly established that their product, when used as directed, caused death and that this was being widely acknowledged. You know, they eventually lost the propaganda war and everyone finally said, okay, I believe cigarettes are bad for you. Uh, even after all those guys, remember all those executives with their hands up before Congress, cigarettes are not bad for you? Okay, everyone finally figured out that was wrong. What did they do? They acquired other businesses. The R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company is now R.J.R. Nabisco. They make Fig Newtons. How could you not like them now? The oil company should be moving into other aspects of energy rather than fighting this rear guard motion to preserve the, the oil way. I think the idea of tapping local officials to help um, access leaders of, of other groups and businesses is, you know, a, is a great one and can be very, very fruitful. Um, you know, as Tip O'Neill said, all politics is local, and you know it, it's absolutely true. And I think it's 
you know, particularly, it always amazes me when I think about the 435 members of Congress. I mean, they are wired in to those districts. And, um, uh, you know, if you can bring uh, coalitions together uh, to, to, to talk to them, um, that, uh, that that's, how, that's how you influence policy. And, you know, it, it, it's definitely, uh, well, one thing that's so great about uh, CCL is it's, you know, it's, it's nonpartisanship and it's, you know, bringing together lots of voices uh, around this objective of getting a carbon tax and dividend passed. Um, and, you know, yesterday we heard from uh, Tom Stevenson and, and, and the, the influence of, of George Schultz and, uh, you know, f folks from that part of the political spectrum is, is enormous. And, 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 you know, hats off to CCL for bringing them into the, into the tent. So the more, uh, the more diverse voices, the, the better. And, and local electives can help with that. So let's do questions from the audience. You know the drill? Yeah. So we have a, there's, <laughs> with the time we have for questions, uh, we're about six or seven minutes for questions. So again, one, one part question, no follow-ups. And the shorter the question and the shorter the answer, the more questions we will get to. I'm also taking questions here. So um, that's available if you want to submit questions online or by text. Could you start us off? Yeah, hi, my name is Ashley. Um, I'm from District 1 in Chico. Uh -huh. um, and I drove four hours to be here, so I just wanted to thank everyone for making this happen. Um, so my representative is Doug LaMolfa. Um, he's really, he cares a lot about forestry. He's a farmer. Um, and I was just kind of curious. He's been very dismissive about joining the Climate Solutions Caucus. Um, and, you know, I'm going to be volunteering for a Democratic candidate this upcoming year. Um, but I wanted to know that if he gets reelected, um, what we can do to try to convince him more because he's, like I said, very dismissive. So what he cares about is forestry? Okay. <laughs> and we've talked to him about it, so I'm just, I don't know what else we can say other than... When the atmosphere at this planet was 100% carbon dioxide, what gave us the oxygen we have? Plants. <laughs> They're the things that eat carbon dioxide. Um, the forests are like the most important resource this world has in combating that problem. And maybe uh, you can tap into his interest in that regard, that he can be, since he's an expert on forestry, you know, we really need your help on this. You know, da 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 da. Uh, maybe you could enlist him to use his expertise because what he's an expert at is, the key, is a key part of the solution. And he's a rice farmer, isn't he? True. It's weird. Weird that he's so dismissive with all of that. So. Did you say a rice farmer? He's a rice farmer. I think it's weird that anyone's a rice farmer in California. <laughs> 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 I thought, you know, you should have patties and stuff to grow rice. <laughs> You've heard this before, but you know, you have to just stay at it and you have to bring, again, many voices as possible uh, into that office. I mean, elected officials do, you know, they do respond to their constituents. They're really good at that, actually. I mean, you know, congressional members, that's what they care about. And um, so, you know, it's, uh, watching the film yesterday and about the, the guy who's been fighting the good fight for 10 years, I mean, that's, that's inspiring. And, and in a lot of these districts, it's, that's what it's going to take is just keeping at it. And I, you know, District 1 is, um, you know, for those of you who don't know, it's Oregon, Nevada border all the way down practically to Sacramento. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very diverse um, district, mostly rural and, and poor. And thank you so much for driving down here for this. Um, yay. Um, but we've got 53 congressional districts in California. Um, I think there are nine Democrats in the um, Climate Solutions Caucus and four, five uh, Republicans, two of whom are not running for re-election, Issa and Royce. Um, so it's reaching out. It wouldn't be great if you know, we talk about what you know, California can do, and, and we like to think that as goes California, so goes the nation. Wouldn't it be great if all 53 congressional districts in California, whether they're 
Republican or Democrat kind of irrelevant when you talk about climate if all of them were part of the Climate Solutions Caucus. That would be amazing. 53. Oh, great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this is to Dave Pine. Could, could you expand on the possibility of making the case with bodies like the County Association of Governments to expand this conversation with? Yeah, sure. Uh, again, it's kind of an idea that just kind of came to mind as I've been sitting here, so uh, I'll continue to think about it with you right now. Um, so, you know, CSAC uh, represents uh, all, all the counties, and, you know, they are, you know, very, um, you know, influential in, 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 in state policy making. Um, so I, I would, I think there would be a good chance that a number of us from um, uh, counties around the state that are uh, very focused on this issue could, you know, urge them to, you know, pass a resolution in support of carbon fee and, and dividend. Did you did it at CSAC? Then, it, that's true, it was done at the legislature. So it was done at the legislature, we ought to be able to do it at, at uh, CSAC too. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Connie from Fresno. And uh, thank you for being here and thank you for all that you're doing. Um, so, Dave, I think you brought up the issue of the fact that the uh, effects of climate change are already baked into the future. And that's raised in my mind a question that I've had and a concern for the, um, the fickleness and the short term memory of the electorate. And so, how do we talk about this in a way to not promise any? immediate effects because my concern is that okay so we get uh, finally carbon pricing passed and then you know we continue to have uh, big storms and droughts etc and all these things and I would expect the opposition very quickly to say well look it's not helping so how do we talk about that and prepare people for that by the way this is Dave that's Chris by the way wow well, I'm Chris <laughs> <laughs> My name tag says it. I'm Chris. <laughs> Did you? Were you asking Dave? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and he's right about that. So this has to be pitched at. This is gonna get worse unless. Right. What we have now is the new normal. And every time we hear about one of these events, we have to say, you know, that's caused by global warming. You know, we got to make sure it doesn't get worse. You're right, we can't be promising it'll all undo itself. That would only happen if we became extinct, and one of, one of our missions, I think, is for us not to become extinct. Um, you know, you don't want to be like the gentleman from Oklahoma who brought a snowball into the Senate and said, this is proof that global warming is not happening, and wrong. <laughs> it's a much more complicated issue than that. But you are right, where we set the expectation is very critical. The ex you should say, we can expect two category five hurricanes and wildfires every year going forward, and it'll get worse unless. You know, the sea level rise is the least concerning part of this problem. Frankly, all the CO2 that goes in the ocean and acidifies it and dissolves the little calcite shells of the bottom of the food chain, even my sophomores in high school, when I said to them, Hey, what do you suppose happens to us at the top of the food chain when the bottom of the food chain goes away? Knew the answer. That's really a problem. But we don't have, we, we don't have science anymore, so. Um, uh, <laughs> I have no idea what I was gonna say. Yeah, we're in a post-fact society. Um, yeah, I think that it comes back to money and it comes back to uh, the, the cost. And even if you think that uh, a drought, for instance, is a temporary thing or storm systems are temporary, um, the cost is extraordinary, not just in, in dollars, but in human life. And um, farmers know this, farmers are seeing this. So when we talk about what can we do in California or across other parts of the country, it is that localized impact um, and people are, you know, the seed catalog companies, anyone here plant, order things from seed catalogs? They started changing their 
um, lines about what is going to grow where. Okay, several years, quite a few years ago. So, you know, if, if people, and as I mentioned, you know, our, our fire chief said, yeah, you know, even the guys that, on the line who were like, yeah, yeah, climate change, nah, nah, are saying, yeah, there's something different. So it's, it's, we're seeing a human cost, we're seeing a cost of farmers. Um, as we, you know, talk with, um, you know, I, I kind of like the idea of sister cities, um, and I kind of like the idea of sister counties or, or you know, red, red communities and blue communities talking to each other. Uh, the mayor of Lancaster is a hardcore Republican, and that's where Proterra electric buses are made. Um, that, I mean, that's, you know, and he is an absolute believer uh, in, in climate change and the impacts to his community, and has, I think, made his promise that they're going to be a, a carbon-free, or some not carbon-free, but like 100% solar or renewable energy. I forget what his commitment was, but you know they're going there. Um, so it's finding those people, and in every in every location, and, and whether it's a staff person who you know or you can get a meeting with, or it's that one person on the city council, that one person on the board of supervisors in your county, talking to those people, and as Chris said, it's the business community. It's it's just this, you know. It's, a, it's the network, it's the web, and that's how we make change happen. And we don't have a lot of time, so you don't get any time off. You gotta do this every day. That's just kind of the bottom line. Uh, thank you. <laughs> we, we have time for one more question. Okay, so yeah, hi, oh, I'm Trish from Richmond, and this question is for Leslie. As you probably know, we've had uh, Paul Hawken on our monthly call about yeah. Project Drawdown, and I'm just wondering how Drawdown Marin is going. Ha, <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, about a year and a half ago, after a couple of glasses of wine at a dinner party um, with some of my environmentalist friends, I said, wouldn't it be great if we had a countywide campaign to just completely go renewable energy, get rid of fossil fuels in Marin? Wouldn't that be cool? And they were like, yeah. What are you going to do about it? And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> OK. Um, and so my boss, um, Kate Sears, has been very focused on adaptation and sea level rise. We've done some amazing projects to educate the community and really kind of test drive virtual reality, which San Mateo um, has done as well, um, the same project with climate access and FEMA. Um, but this Drawdown Marin uh, idea just took on a life of its own, and it, we're, we're flying the plane as we're building it. I'll just confess that right now. Um, it is, it's everybody, it's all in, and it's 100% renewable energy. It is um, low carbon or zero emission vehicles throughout our entire transportation sector, and that's a lot. Um, it is energy efficiency in our buildings and our infrastructure, so it's not just houses and offices, but it's also sewer, sewer treatment and water, I mean, our water district uses more electricity than any other um, entity in our county um, from pumping. Um, so, and a, a carbon sequestration and re regenerative agriculture and local food and food waste. Uh, in Project Drawdown, uh, the number one thing is refrigeration globally. The number three thing is, the third thing is um, food waste. So how do we address that? In Marin County, we have, you know, kind of the, 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 the basket where, where organic farming, at least we like to think so, started, right? So, we also waste a lot in Marin County. So how do we reduce that? So it's methane digesters and it's you know buying no more than you're going to eat so that we're not pitching so much out. It's looking at uh, carbon sequestration in our farming and how do we then you know talk to the major farm. We've got little tiny farms in Marin and we've got ranches. So how do we scale that up? to share this information with, with what's happening in the valley with big farms. So it's an all-in thing. We're, we're starting to pull together working groups that are that technical working groups that, that can really do drill downs in the six sectors. Climate resilient communities is the, the sixth one. Um, and we're aligning with the California state standards so that we're not off on a frolic and, you know, of our own and let's make everything sustainable. It's really focused on going to fossil free county. And if we get there, um, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to 
acknowledge the panel, and then right. I'll, I'll take us to the break. Add one thing. Well, I'm supposed to acknowledge the panel now. Let's all acknowledge the panel. <laughs> I think Chris wants to have so, a last word. Well, okay, no. go Chris. <laughs> I'm going to say something too. Oh, okay. Good. So first, with regard to methane, <laughs> one of the EPA rules that they're trying to roll back at the federal level is preventing the release of methane from landfills. So that's something you can do at the local level instead, yeah. right? Methane's got 86 times the global warming potential of CO2. So if the feds are going to undo that rule, let's see if we can adopt it locally. But secondly, these are hard times on our issue, especially at the federal government. So for those of us who deal with fact denial and stuff every day, I just want to say it's very helpful to be here with you, with a sympathetic group, you know? I don't get to interact with that many sympathetic people. It's very helpful. You're going to help me go back to work tomorrow and keep doing my job. You know, I just wanted to uh, just share a brief reflection about, you know, politics and being an elected official. Um, you know, I like to see myself as kind of a policy wonk who really wants to understand the ins and outs of the issues I'm dealing with and trying to, you know, find out what the best, uh, best way forward is, what's, what the right answer is. Um, and I've been, before I got into elected office, I really kind of kind of scratched my head about, you know, how is it that, you know, people can just vote the wrong way, you know? <laughs> and for example, where, you know, there's kind of three groups here, right? There's the folks who are with you, and there are folks you're never going to get. And then there's that fo there's a group in the middle that are kind of with you, but for some political reason, you know, are slow or can't pull the trigger. So that's the kind of the group that I'm, you know, really fascinated with. And I used to have no sympathy with them. And I have a lot more now after, you know, being in, in elected office. Um, you know, I don't have the risk of being primaried, but, you know, there are interest groups and there are, like, relationships with my colleagues and, you know, you know, from time to time, I, you know, I make a decision to let it go. And then I go back, at, go back home and say, Jesus, you know, should I have let that go? Uh, it's either because, again, a relationship issue or, or, or maybe, you know, some, some political issue. And so I kind of just struggle with it personally. And, but I don't, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not like a Republican who's going to get primaried. So, I have a little more empathy for them now after kind of hold, holding the job. Um, and, but I also believe that, you know, people are capable of, of elected officials and part of their job is to assert leadership and to take risks and to act uh, and to bring their constituents along and not necessarily always be forced by their constituents to do something. So, uh, uh, you know, they, they need to be inspired and they can do the, you know, it does, it, it, politics is, is tough, but it, you, we, we've got to, we got to, uh, you know, have them listen to their better angels. And we look back at history and we see elected of officials, um, and the ones we read most about are at the national level, who, who did it, you know? Somehow they said, you know, I'm gonna just muster up the courage and do this. And uh, this is, um, you know, if we need courage anywhere, it's here. And so when, in talking to members, you know, particularly in these, the, that, that middle group, you know, you have to think of uh, inspiring them to be courageous. So, I want to thank the panelists for your passion and your deep commitment is very evidence here and certainly we didn't need coffee in here today but <clears throat> we are having coffee next so we're having a break 
until 11.15. And I want to ask the panelists if one of the main principles of CCL is respecting people's time. And so uh, you're welcome to stay for the break and answer questions. But if you have to go, I know you're all busy. Um, and then after the break, we have a half an hour session where we're going to hear from Rob Beggs, who's um, <coughs> in the conservative caucus. And we're trying to attract members to CCL on the, that side of the aisle. And then we're going to hear from Jerry Hinkle, who's on the Progressive Caucus. So uh, we should wrap up around 11.45, but if you can stay, people might want to come up and ask you questions. So thank you. Great.